On my first day in the military, I'm sitting in a dark movie theater with 300 new recruits and listening to one ugly sergeant instructor, an old soldier, talking to us. You have not joined the paratroopers to serve your country because you feel you are something. You have not joined to serve democracy or freedom. You have volunteered for the paratroopers to become killers. And it is my job to train you to become killers, the best killers. From now on, on the first thing in the morning, you should ask yourself, am I ready to go to combat? Is my platoon is ready for combat? Sadly enough, years later, I will use the same words to welcome the new recruits of my platoon. I was 18 when I came home for dinner and to tell my family that I just joined the paratroopers and for the first time, I saw my dad crying. After a year in service, they figured out I was pretty good at it and sent me for commando training for another five months, part Navy SEAL, part Special Force, explosives, sniper, guerrilla warfare, some of the toughest training. I was now a member of a team of 10 commandos, ready to intervene anywhere in the world on a few hours' notice. Skydiving at 15,000 feet at night in stormy weather with 80-pound bags of equipment, weapons, munition. We had fun doing it. I wanted more. My first operation was in Chad, patrolling the border with Libya for three months. We saw we were a bunch of Lawrence of Arabia. Nothing really happened. I didn't enlist to escape anything. Sure, my family was maybe a little poor at the time, but my parents were always there for us and always food on the table. My mom made clothes for us. We never miss anything and always plenty of love. I enlisted because I wanted to, the adventures. I wanted to test myself. What kind of man will I be in war? Finally, in September 83, we got the call for a good war, Lebanon. I didn't know yet, but it would be a fateful year for me. We bitch landed out, out of those World War II landing boats. We could not use the airport due to the fighting, but nobody was shooting at us. That was good news. We were slightly disappointed. A few hours later, we were in our new post on a green line near the French embassy. At 2 o'clock in the morning, someone welcomed us by blowing a couple of kilos of plastic explosive below our windows. Nobody was hurt. Just a reminder, this was a war zone, just in case we forgot. Our mission, bring peace in between factions. How the hell you do that? I was not trained to do peace. I was trained for combat and to kill. When is the last time a soldier won the Nobel Peace Prize? Our rules of engagement were very simple. You only return fire when one of your guys is killed. That really sucked. Every time the, starting for start, every time the fighting started, we had to put ourselves in between the factions to stop the killing. Shiites, Christians, Sunni, Amal, Hezbollah, Palestinians, Syrian, one big, happily dysfunctional family. Our post got shot at almost every night. RPGs, small firearms, nothing big, but we never really slept at night. Occasional artery shell or mortars for good measure. On October 23rd, 1983, 6 in the morning, everything changed. Two suicide bombers drove the truck full of explosives into the US Marine barracks at the airport and into the post of a French paratrooper company. 241 U.S. Marines and 58 French paratroopers killed. The first couple of days, we were hoping to find survivors. But after, we were going through the rubbles looking for bodies. I didn't know then, but the smells of war were imprinting themselves in my brain, in my subconscious, to never leave me. The smell of burned flesh. The smell of rotting bodies. The sweet and sour smell of blood. These males will come back to ambush me in the future. One time, one of my soldiers called me. Hey, Sergeant, can you help me to move this bloody sandbag? I grabbed the corners, but realized it was not a sandbag, 
but a bloody torso, cake with mud, no arms, no legs, no head. I saw the dark tag. I could not read the name, and I'm glad I didn't. I will have to explain later to his family how we found him. A few days later, we'll have a ceremonial for our lost friends, singing the prayer of the paratroopers. My God, my God, give me the storm. Give me the suffering. Give me the strength in combat. Give me what everybody don't want. <clears throat> I don't want rest. I don't want help. This has been asked from you already too much. My God, give me force and courage. My God, my God, give me glory in combat. My God, give me death in combat. After that day, the rule engagement changed. You shoot first and ask questions later. And the killing started in earnest. Beirut had become a sniper's Disneyland. On my return from Beirut, I realized I was done with the Mita experience. I found the adventures, I passed the test. I was to call it quit, and plus, I fell in love with a girl, and I followed her all the way to Taos, New Mexico. <laughs> September 83, September 84, what a year. Went to war, saw combat, fell in love. What else you really need? For a while, I forgot all about the military, the war, the commando team. I was, at, I was not missing any of it. I was looking for a new life with my girl and have a good time. I hate dreams. I hate other people's dreams. I'm sick of other people's dreams. I have no dreams. I wake up every morning without dreams. Why should I have dreams? I don't need to dream to rehash everything that I've done and seen. There is nothing wrong with me. I just stopped dreaming 23 years ago in Beirut, that's all. Even my ex-wife called me once. She had a bad dream about me. I was ca caught in a tank battle in some war zone taking pictures and got killed or badly hurt. She was not sure. A bad dream was not very clear. You guessed it, a month later in the West Bank I survived a tank shell that exploded 50 feet for me. But I felt I was lucky that day. A young 21 years old Palestinian fighter was standing next to me, in between me and the impact of the shell. He took the blunt of the shredding shrapnels, his body cut in half, he died instantly. I was okay, I was not hurt, just smeared from his blood. So if you dream about me, do me a favor, please, please, please keep it to yourself. I find myself a new mission to change the world with my photographs. Wanting to be a photojournalist was my dream since I was 16 years old. So there I was going to change the world with my cameras. But that noble idea went away quickly. I understood I couldn't change the world. All humans have done for the last 10,000 years is eat, drink, shit, make love, and go to war. Who am I to change the world? So maybe I should lower my expectation, only if I could make a difference. Tell the stories of war with my photographs. After a few years of conflict coverage, Nicaragua with the Contras, and the jungle of Chiapas with Zapatistas, Palestine, Israel, Iraq, I didn't make a dent. Didn't make any difference to them. They keep on to eat, drink, shit, make love, and go to war. Maybe I will try only to show what needs to change, what has to change, what can be changed. But sometimes I feel like I'm wasting my time with my cameras, taking chances in war zones. Sure, any magazine is ready to give $5 million for the Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie's baby pictures, but they sure won't pay me 25 bucks for my pictures. So I guess now I'm just merely a witness of human insanity. All I want really is to be there and sit it all for myself. Now you're going to see some of the photographs of what I've seen. <laughs>